EMS training at Station 32. I would like to introduce a friend and colleague of mine, Miss Deanna Nahara. She's a PA who currently works in the emergency department up at Carroll Hospital Center as well as part-time in a mental health clinic. She has worked with Carroll County's a policy with opioid uh, treatment and addiction and she's here tonight to help us get a, a better understanding as, as to how to deal with some of our mental health emergencies we come across. There are sign-in sheets going around and there are also handouts to go along with tonight's training. If you didn't get one, they're up here in the front of the room. So uh, again, thank you all and here's Deanna. Thank you. All right. All right. So um, I do talk fast. I apologize in advance. So if there's something you want me to restate or questions or whatever, this is what do you need from me? I'm here to help you out in any way that I can. So if there's something we get off tra on tangents or off track, I'm fine with that because it's what you guys need in the field every single day. Um, as Randy said, I work in the emergency department as a PA. Um, I, we do medical screening of psych patients, but other than that, it's kind of where I stop. Um, but I do also work in a community mental health clinic. So I see the people for follow-up. I see where they end up down the, the road a little bit. So why should you care about any of this? Well, because it's good to know. Um, but also the national EMS guidelines say that you should. And then there was just a paper that came out that reviewed the common textbooks used in 305 training programs for paramedics. And most of them did not cover all the topics that you were supposed to be responsible for um, on the national guidelines. So it's one of those, oops, um, you know, you're supposed to know all of this, but the actual training books that you're learning from don't even cover it. They don't even have it listed in their index. So these are all the things that are actually from the national guidelines that you're supposed to be competent about. We are not going to talk about all of those. We're going to, again, and talk about on big ones and ones that are important to you. So with that, I want to see what do you guys want to talk about first? What's kind of in your in your wheelhouse? What do you run into? What are you concerned about? So we got the agitated patient with and without medications. We can talk a little bit about addiction. And then we have delirium, personality disorders, somatization, and then a couple of activities if you decide to get out of your chairs. And then finally just a wrap up kind of thing too. Get him to care about these patients. All right, get it out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so first, trying to avoid medications. So with memes, they say the safer model, and there's going to be a couple different models. Whatever alphabet soup works for you to help you memorize it. So stabilize the situation. Of course, don't become a victim. So always looking around, seeing what's going on. Is everybody going crazy? Is there a gas leak or something that's making them all bonkers? Assess and acknowledge that it is a crisis, and that's assessing and acknowledging for the person as well. Hey, I see things are looking like a little out of control. There's 20 police officers and all of us here. That must be pretty terrible. What can we do about that? How can we calm things down? Facilitate the identification and activation of resources. Some people get really upset when you're calling them a name they don't want to be called by because it's a trigger for them. And the more you say, you know, hey, Edward, Edward, calm down. He's like, my name's Ed. Ed, what can we do? You know, don't keep insisting on those little things that are triggering them. Encouraging them to use resources and take actions in their best interest. So that's not just your best interest, because you have to get them on board with that. So partnering with the person to have that happen. And then recovery or referral, leaving the patient in the care of a responsible person or professional or transporting. So sometimes you can decompress a situation, it's a domestic incident, and you can get them to calm down and the police say we're not pressing charges, they don't need to go to the hospital, and all's well that ends well. But you want to end with that. So the goals of psychiatric medic uh, management exclude a medical source. Always come back to the basics. Are they sick? Um, and, and how are they sick? And what can you do? What kind of intervention is needed? Stabilization of an acute crisis as best you can. And avoiding coercion. Um, that's hard when you're partnering with police on scene. You know, a lot of times the police have their own agenda and you're trying, you're stuck in the middle because you have the syringe in your hand of Haldol and Ativan, right? And the police are like, just take them down. And you're like, well, maybe that's not the best interest <laughs> The patient. So you have to figure out that middle ground for you. What's going to work the best? 
and treating in the less restrictive setting. Now, if you roll up and they're already hogtied, mm, what are you going to do about that? You know, how can you minimize the danger to yourself, danger to the patient? You know, obviously the police aren't going to say, oh, we're happy to take the handcuffs off and to have a conversation now that you're here. And that's not necessarily the safest thing either. So what's a way that you can partner with them to keep them safe and keep them healthy? Forming that therapeutic alliance. So that doesn't mean you partner with them saying, yeah, all cops are jerks and I agree and the cops should go down and I'm going to help you press charges. But at the same time, finding a balance with them of saying, how can we work together? You know, like you don't want a pill. You don't want a shot. Can I give you a pill? You don't want to go in handcuffs. Can we like work it out? Can you give me the knife? Can you drop the gun? How can we kind of match up? And then disposition and aftercare. So there is a nice way to do some history taking, um, and that's the bathe for history technique. What's going on? So, hey man, what's going on tonight? I just rolled up, fill me in, tell me what happened. Take them at their word. You know, if they say there are pink elephants dancing, I hear you, man. Don't say you see them too, because they can tell when you're lying. People know when you're lying, even when they're actively psychotic. They know you're lying to them, but you can say, man, that must be pretty terrifying. Tell me about that. Or, hey, it seems like you're laughing at that. Is it, is it a good joke? Get me in on the joke. What's happening for you? How do you feel about the situation? You know, the elephants dancing, are they making you happy or are they scaring the crap out of you? Because that's going to dictate what direction you go. If the person is actively hallucinating and you can say, you know, I see how terrified you are about that, what's going to make you feel safe? And if they're like, man, if I can just like put a blanket over my head so that I can't see them, if I could just shove something in my ears, here dude, here's some guys, put it in your ears, we'll block that sound out. You want the, you know, the, we have ear protection, will that help? hey, you're listening to me, you're not mocking me, you're not telling me it's not real, you're partnering with me. What troubles you most about the situation? Sometimes it's not what you think. They may not be worried about the voices, they may be worried about something else entirely. So just because they're actively psychotic doesn't mean that's a problem for them. I have several patients who hear voices all the time, they know that they're not real, they say, well, you know, I just need something to drown them out right now. Or, you know what, I really need is space. I need somebody to back off. Okay, how far away do we need to get to keep you safe? but at the same time make you not feel stressed out. Can I stand five feet? Can I stand six feet? You know, we can't have you running around without clothes on or attacking people, but what can we do to help you feel comfortable in this situation? What helps you handle the situation? Hey man, you know, it seems like you're pretty stressed out. What's worked for you in the past when you get stressed out, when you get angry? He's like, oh, I like to punch people. Well, we can't really have you punching people, you know, so what else can we have you do today? Well, you know, the cops came in here and they started saying all this stuff. Yeah, man, that's got to suck. So, you know, whew, you know, if we could only get the cops to leave, but I can't make them leave either. And they're only going to leave when the situation's calmed down. So how can we help you get yourself under control? Do you need to punch a pillow? Do you need to scream? Do you need to, what do you need to do? And then warn the cops before they start doing it. Because the cops are going to see him lunging or doing something and then they're going to shoot. So you need to keep your safe and warn them. Say, hey, Jim feels a little bit calmer when he does jumping jacks. He's going to do some jumping jacks. And let them have at it if that relaxes him and diffuses the situation. And then empathy. This sucks, man. You know you're facing charges. You went off on a cop. You know, you bit this person. You threw something. It's a really tough situation. But what can we do to make it a little bit better? How can we make this not be a worse situation? Right now, you're facing misdemeanor charges. If you keep going, it's going to be a felony. You know, right now you haven't violated parole, but if this keeps happening, it might happen. How can we stop this from getting worse? Find that silver lining, that positive spin to things. You know, your reaction makes sense to me. You know, you, this cop came in, you were just minding your own business on the street corner, of course, and they came in and just started, you know, messing with you. That sucks. And now we're here and everything's just spiraling out of control. How can we help get control of the situation? In Alzheimer's, you also have to be very careful because they don't realize everything that they're forgetting and they get mad that they can't remember. So it takes a little bit of a different twist sometimes, but it's the same basic things. Don't argue, agree. Don't reason, divert. Don't say, well, come on, you know, you remember. They probably don't. So to never shaming them, distract them, don't lecture them, reassure them. Don't say remember. Remember, man, I just told you that. I don't remember, and it just makes me more mad the more you keep harping on that. So if they're talking about the 1950s, say, hey, tell me about that. How was that time for you? Yeah, how much did gas cost? What was the price of milk? What was your favorite thing to do? Do you remember the ball team that year? Whatever it is that's a trigger for them, have them go back to that time. 
Don't command people to do things. Look, you need to do this or else shit's going to hit the fan. Say, hey, shit's going to hit the fan. What can we do to stop it from happening? Have them come up with a solution so that they're a part of that. And then don't force and reinforce. So Sayings to Avoid, this is a really good book, uh, Verbal Judo. He's a police officer, and he talks a lot about how, you know, he used to be a beat cop, and he emphasizes beat. He said, you know, we'd come into a situation, we'd beat him down. We'd beat him into submission, and that wasn't working. And he said, there's got to be an easier way. And so some of the things he says, watch what you say, because what happens in yourself when somebody says, hey, calm down? Don't tell me to calm down. You calm down, right? It just gets things going. So what can you say instead of that? Or come here. I'm not coming here. It brings out the inner two-year-old in all of us when you say these sort of things. So and it's not to make this person seem like a child, but how do you deal with a toddler? This is a big toddler that you can't pick up and set down, right? So because those are the rules. Well, I don't like the rules. <laughs> say, well, that's the cops' rules. You know, we got different rules. How can we work together? You wouldn't understand. You're right, try me. Help, help me to understand. Explain it to me in a way that I can get it. It's none of your business. You're right, but I'm here now. So what are we going to do? Where are we moving from here? What's your problem? You're my problem. Well, I just showed up. Now I'm your problem. You're my problem. And it just goes back and forth and out of control. I'm not going to say it again. How many times did your parents say that to you growing up? And then what did they do? They said it again anyways. <laughs> so then it turns you into a liar because you already did something you said you weren't going to do. So just stop saying that. This is for your own good. And we probably say that a lot of time before we give them medicine, right? This is for your own good. You're too agitated. You're too angry. Why don't you be reasonable? I am being reasonable for the situation that I see from my perspective. So when it's for your own good, well, that's you telling me it's for my own good. You've got to figure out what they want in the matter. Be genuine. Again, they can smell it, all right? They can smell fear, they can smell when you're lying, they can smell when you're bullshitting them. So you be genuine in the moment. And understand, reflect back, summarize. Hey man, so this is what I've heard has happened. You were standing on the corner, the cops rolled in, one thing led to another, now I'm here, this is going down, and you just feel out of control. Does that seem right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Good, let's go from there. Little things like matched pacing. If they're pacing back and forth, you match them. You walk right next to them, and then you start slowing down. Because think about what happens when you're walking with somebody who's a fast walker or somebody who's walking with a slow walker. You tend to match their gait. It's mirroring. Same thing physically. Their arms are crossed. You walk up like that to start, and then you slowly start to uncross your arms. You'll watch, they'll start to mirror you. And that's, a, that's an unconscious thing that they start to do. Voice dropping is really big. So you're in a big fight and you're arguing, no, you're going to listen to me, and then you start to slowly back off. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> they have to be quiet to hear you. And offering choices wherever you can. Do you want to sit up or do you want to lay down? The cops are saying you have to be in handcuffs. Do you want one handcuff to the stretcher or do you want your wrists together? You know, I understand the cops have you in four-point restraints. Do you want on your side or do you want on your back? What are ways that we can make this a little bit more comfortable? Can I get you a pillow? You have to do a little customer service. And believe me, I hate that term in medicine as much as anybody. But when you're dealing with somebody that's genuinely agitated, you need to find that middle ground. You need to comfort them in some way. So Project Beta is the best practices in the evaluation and treatment of agitation. They have a series of five articles that are in the handout. Um, it's free from the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. And they basically said, we're doing this wrong. We are restraining too many people. And when people get restrained, people get hurt, both the patient and everybody else around it. Think about what happens at a scene when somebody is being restrained. How many more resources are involved? How much more paperwork is involved, right? If only to save the paperwork. Stop restraining people if you can and get home faster. So there's a lot of good articles that break down all these different steps. We're going to talk about de-escalation of situations. And this is directly from their article. Respect personal space because that's safe in addition to not amplifying the situation. So stepping back as much as you can. If there's tons of people and spectators moving them back, give the police something to do. Say, can you secure the scene and go do this? That gets them out of there, puts you one-on-one -on -one with the person. 
don't be provocative. Watch that body language. So if you go up arms crossed, immediately start to relax your shoulders, put your hand in your pocket, be aware of what you're saying physically. If you're in their face, they're gonna come right back or they're gonna run scared. But either way, it's not gonna end the way you want it to. Establish verbal contact. So how many times have you come on scene and there's seven people all yelling at one another? You don't even know what happened. Everybody's screaming one thing or the next. Somebody's mumbling incoherently. One person should be that point person that talks to them. That's to improve the communication and then they start to partner with that individual. Most likely it's gonna be the person that's gonna ride in the back of the rig with them or it's a spare person that can sit with them while other things are happening. Hey bud, look at me, stay in the moment. There's gonna be a lot of stuff going on but you and I, let's talk. Let's talk this out. Let's get to a, an agreement that we can have. Everything's gonna happen around us. There's a lot going on but you and I are gonna partner. What happens if the first person talking to the patient is a police officer and maybe he's a little inappropriate or something bump them out okay and that would be one of those situations like hey hey i'm here let, let's let me take care of this you know hey you've done a great job so far i'm going to butt in you know you called for reinforcements i'm your reinforcement de-escalate them too you know and then that sees then you now outrank the officer to the patient so they're going to respect you more a little bit too if they see you can handle that interaction well now if you come in and you're busting you know bumping chests with them no i'm in charge no i'm in charge they're not going to believe you either so that sometimes takes it actually is better to focus on that first all right, be concise. When you're agitated, it is impossible to hear things. So you have to repeat your message over and over and over. It sounds childish, but think about that two-year-old melting down in the grocery store. We're going home, we're going home, we're going home, we're going home. You keep acting like that, we're going home. And you just keep repeating the same thing, the broken record. And it seems uh, very like, well, why aren't they getting it? Because they're listening and responding to everything else that's going on, and they're also in that inner turmoil. Particularly if they're psychotic, if they're hearing voices, it is very hard to cut through that to listen to what's going on. So be concise and repeat yourself. Identifying wants and feelings. What did you expect was gonna happen, you know? You fired a gun in a public area, of course everybody shows up. You don't have to be sarcastic about it, but point out like, yeah, we all came because we were worried about you. Because, you know, it seemed like you were stressed out. It seemed like a lot of shit's going down. We're here to try and get this situation under control. We want what's best for everybody. Don't be reasonable, don't calm down. If you'd calm down, this wouldn't happen. He knows that or she knows that got to get past that and talk about the other things. What can we do? Well, I want a million dollars in a helicopter. You know, <laughs> me too, man. Me too. So what else can we do? You know, well, I want this and this. All right, I'll work on that. But in the meantime, can I offer you a blanket, a pillow, a sandwich, whatever, you, whatever it takes? Listen to closely to what they're saying and summarize it, repeat it back. So what I'm hearing, this is what happened, but also tag in on their feelings. You know, so what I'm hearing you say is, but it's funny, I, I can't get the sense that you're really mad, you're really upset by this, you're really, you're laughing when you say this, is, is, it, is it funny? Because, I mean, we're all taking it pretty seriously, but, you know, I want to make sure that we're doing what's best. Because some people laugh when they're stressed out, and so that mismatch can be really hard. Particularly the cops, they get ticked about that, so you're just mocking the situation. Relax, we're gonna talk it out, we're gonna get there. Hey, you know, you keep joking about this and you're facing some pretty serious charges, man. That's pretty, yeah, man, yeah, this is great, this is fun. So what can we do to get through it? How can we get past it? Miller's Law states to understand what another person is saying, you must assume that it's true and try and imagine what it could be true of. So that is, he sees the elephants, he's hearing voices. Don't say, I don't see any elephants. They seem real to you. Are they scary to you? Are they reassuring to you? Are they comfort to you? What does it mean to you? A lot of people interpret things very differently. Um, so that may be cultural, that can be religious, that can also be psychosis. What does it mean to you? Agree to disagree. So if you agree with the truth, yeah, man, you keep getting stuck, or the cop did that to you, or you got tased four times, I, that sucks. I see that that happened, but I'm here now. What can we do now? Let's move forward from this. Agree in principle. So he's complaining about being disrespected by anybody. You don't have to say, I agree you were disrespected by the police because then the police are going to hate your guts. But you can agree in principle. I can see how you would be disrespected. I can see how that is upsetting to you. <coughs> so you're agreeing that they're upset. You're agreeing with the emotions underneath of that. 
and then agree with the odds. If they're agitated because of the weight, which we get all the time, say anybody would be upset by that. Anybody would be upset by the fact that you waited an hour for the cops to come when you complain of a breaking and entering. Anybody would be upset by that. I can see that. But we're here now. What can we do now? Bring them back to the present. And again, you have to repeat your message multiple times. And agree as much as possible. Lay down the law and set limits. So you do have to set limits with individuals a lot of times. Um, you know, I'm sorry we can't do that. You know, the cops are saying that you can't leave and that does suck, but we've got to do what we've got to do. So how can we make this go as quick as possible? Whenever I have a patient brought in for an EP, the first thing I say to them is, look, I want you to get out of here as quick as you can too. So what can we do to make that happen? You talk to me, you tell me what you need, I'll do what I can, we'll make this as smooth as possible. All right, so if you need a sandwich, you need a drink, you need some medicine, you let me know, just use your words, you know, explain to me what's going on, and that way we can have that conversation from the beginning. I really want you to sit down. When you pace, I feel frightened. It stresses me out. I have a hard time hearing you when you speak that fast or that loud. Can we bring it back down a little bit? Offer choices and, op and optimism. The choices must be realistic. So again, you can't say, well, I'm gonna go get you that plane. They know that you're lying, all right? So you can offer them other things. There may be simple things, like I don't like the color red and you have a red unit. Can I get a yellow unit? We'll, we'll make it happen. It's gonna be a longer wait. Are you okay with waiting a little bit more so we can get you a yellow unit to ride in? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Perfect. Now you've partnered, you're having a conversation and he's less stressed. He may have never told you that he doesn't like the color red unless you got to that conversation point. If the situation worsens, you can say, you know, it looks like this, you're still really angry and I have to make sure that you're safe and I'm safe and we're all safe. So it looks like we're going to have to give you a medicine. Do you want a pill or a shot? You know, F you, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to give you another choice. Do you want the shot in your arm, your leg, or your butt? You know, F you, this, this. All right, looks like, you know, you're, by the way that you're acting, it looks like and the safest way for me to give you the shot is going to be in the leg. I'm sorry, unless you tell me otherwise, that's where it's going. You ready? Three, two, one, boom, medicine's it. And then as they come out of it, you need to debrief with them. Dude, you got so angry, we had to give you medicine. I don't like to have to do that. I don't like to wait, take away your choices, but you weren't making good choices. The choices got you in trouble. So next time before you start to get mad, what can you ask for? What can we do for you? Or ask them, what are your red flags? What are the situ things to you on your side that the situation's getting out of control? How can we help you diffuse that? Well, man, when I start saying this, what you need to do is you just need to give me the pill right then. Got it. Noted. And make a note. And then tell us when you bring them to the emergency department that they've said that so that we can continue that same thing. And that's where you want to have that warm handoff in front of the patient. Hey, Jim here's had a rough day. You know, he said the police just showed up. We're beating on him. And he's really had a tough time. And he would really like a pill, but we didn't have pills, so he said he was willing to wait. Would it be possible to get Jim a pill? Absolutely, Jim, I will get you a pill. Do you have a preference on your pill? I can offer you Ativan or Xanax. I can offer you Zyprexa or Haldol. How would you like it? What do you want? I'm not giving him every choice of everything, but I'm giving him options, which makes him have ownership over the situation. So that didn't work. <laughs> now what do we do? <laughs> we pull out the B-52, right? <laughs> So always, 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 always check a blood sugar. You don't have to do a finger stick. If they have a bloody nose, swipe the bloody nose. Yep. How often does that work? I will tell you, there are drunk whisperers and then there are agitators. And I'm sure you know on your cruise who's the drunk whisperer and who's the agitator. It is very dependent on the individuals. Um, and that's when Project Beta, um, when they came out, they did some after studies. And their data, when they implemented training across their hospital systems, dropped restraints in half, dropped involuntary medications in half, but also dropped injuries in half. Um, because again, when you have a show of force, you know you have the maintenance man pulling on gloves and everybody's just piling on somebody's getting their head whacked into a wall and those kind of things so the the statistics are pretty impressive coming out of that yeah Andrew so the how often it works um, is also partially dependent like you said on who's doing it mm -hmm. but when we had this situation in the other hospital um, one of the things that's to realize is a whole everyone in the room needs to be de-escalated de got there before you yep and the, the piece with that is how often it works is how much you can either get the extraneous, I mean, tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. if you can get the extraneous people out of the room, yep. um, and um, it, it's a lot, it's 
a lot better. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things you'll notice a lot of hospitals are going restraint free. And that's not just physical restraints, that's chemical restraints and voluntary holds and things like that. Because they realize if we train everybody from the maintenance man all the way to the CEO on how to do this, then you have administrative support, you have support from your security team, and everybody has the same, I'm going to be the broken record, I'm going to be the broken record, I'm going to be the broken record, and they all have the same message. So the patients aren't getting confused, you have everybody on, on, on hand, your Pixis, you know, your Accudose is going to have the right medicines available to you, as opposed to waiting 20 20 minutes for pharmacy to send them up. It has to be an institution change. So I realize you guys are screwed because you're in the field. You can only do so much. And then, of course, it depends on which hospital you end up going to because you walk in the door and it's all the way back up, right amped to where you talk them down from. Or the other way, you drop them off and you watch that person walk up and the situation is de-escalated in five minutes. Perfect example the other day, we had a guy come in in a motor vehicle accident. It was a DUI. He was boarded and collared because it was a rollover and he's drunk and he's flailing he was fighting it the whole way, ripping off his collar, bucking at the things. I walked up and said, hey, I am so glad you're here. I heard it was a rollover car accident. Man, you are lucky to be standing up and walking. Can you have a seat? I just tell me what happened. And he did. He sat down. He's like, I'll tell you, man, this deer came out of nowhere. I'm like, didn't, you know, whatever. But it didn't, it was an immediate de-escalation because I was genuine in the moment. I walked up. I said, you know, I had my white coat on and I could say, hey, tell me what's happening. And the, the medics were like, well, he was yelling at us the whole way. We were going to give him Haldol. No, you just need to just listen to him. Does he need the collar on? Probably. But if that's the big sticking point for him, take it off. Because it's not worth having him completely incapacitated and then irradiating him head to toe to find nothing. So we sat him down. He was sober enough to clear him. I cleared him from the waiting room to police custody, but I cleared him to the waiting room without having to pan scan him or give him held all. So it does really depend on where you're going and who you're talking with. And the other thing is, too, you call ahead for the consult saying, I have a combative individual you get everybody's show of force from the door. And so you have to sometimes say, can the show of force be around the corner? You know, can we get them directly to a room? Can we have other things in place? Good question. Good question, too. Yeah, I, I, I tend to be a touchy person. Sure. With the hand on the shoulder. Absolutely. And only one time has a patient ever said to me, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. I, I find that that's like my natural inclination. Yeah. It's it genuine. Is it, it's not bad to touch somebody? <laughs> Good touch is always fine. <laughs> so, sure? Ask. It's, it's only one time in 40 years, only one ask. time if somebody said to me, don't touch me. Ask. Hey, you yeah, know. See, that's the part I, I, I yeah. an instinct for me. It is. Like, you know, yeah. And I don't ask. But the thing is that they feel that that's a genuine. It's not a pat on the head like, they're there, you'll be okay. Right. They feel that it's a genuine thing. And for some people, it's very comforting. Again, like some people want that blanket tied really tight around them because they like that sensory issue, particularly your people on like the autism spectrum or developmental delay. But other people, they feel claustrophobic. So ask, you know, hey, you know, I, sometimes I just, when I'm stressed out, I like it when somebody sort of rubs my back. Is that cool with you? Like while we're in the rig, you know, or while we're riding, hey, you know, it really helps me when I have have a chaser of water instead of juice or whatever like would that be okay with you like what works for you and partnering with them but yeah it's, if it's genuine on your behalf people will respond to it and I really think unfortunately our as a culture we've gotten very much anti-touch yeah. and the number of times like unfortunately sometimes it's the stinky people they're like I want a hug and you're like oh sure like okay but for them they needed that and and being genuine in that moment of being like I can change my scrubs afterwards <laughs> it'll be okay and giving them the hug because that's what they need in the moment goes a really really long way so absolutely I would just encourage you to ask but touch is, is fantastic or rubbing a hand you know patting a shoulder you say that yeah. it's such a reflex for me that mm -hmm. it's hard to break then it's good it comes from a good place yeah <laughs> absolutely so assess for trauma. If there's any chance of excited delirium, do not give Haldol, and we'll talk about that. And then prepare your airway equipment, because we never know what else they have on board. Remember, the tox screens pick up almost nothing anymore from what's out on the street. So you never know that little extra that you give them. I only gave them 0.5. Boom, they might be down for the count. So have that ready. These are your chemical restraint guidelines. Um, so Haldol weight-based. A lot of times your younger kids with behavioral issues are going to be adult weight. Um, so, you know, it seems sometimes you're like, you gave them how much at all? Weight-based, you know, it may be. So at the same time, if they're huge, don't give them 20 of how tall because that's the weight-based dose. You're going to stop at the adult dose. 
and you can do an IM, IV, um, and then you can also add Versed to that. No consult is needed in Maryland for adding the Versed. You want to have those doses for the elderly. If you're picking somebody up from a nursing home, assisted living, dementia care unit, ask them what their home meds are. What are their daily meds for agitation? Because you know they already tolerate that. And it's better to give them an extra dose of what they're on if you can, than to give them something else and compound issues. You can also, in ours, I always do 5225, so 5 of Haldol, 2 of Ativan, and then 25 of Benadryl. Gives them that little extra, and then it reduces the risk of a dystonic reaction in the same boot. Yeah. Can you repeat that 5225? Yeah, 5225, so 5 of Haldol, 2 of Ativan, and then 25 of Benadryl. But we're going to talk about alternatives, so you, know, you don't have to memorize that one. Um, but yeah, I, I always add the little extra Benadryl. You can also use benztropine, but you guys don't get to carry that. Um, that also works as well. So from the project beta, um, they have a really nice treatment algorithm, and I know how you guys love your algorithms, so I was <laughs> happy that I could find that. Um, so first off, you gotta decide what are they sick with? And that is why you need that conversation, because depending what they're sick from, grossly impacts what the appropriate medication should be. Now I realize in your tackle box, you have Haldol, you have Ativan, you have Versed, you know, you're very limited in what you have, but you can consult for more, or again, giving them their home meds, giving them, asking them to take an extra dose of that. So is the agitation due to delirium, intoxication, a psychiatric disorder, or who the hell knows, it's probably a combination of all of the above. So with delirium, if you think it's an alcohol or benzo with, and withdrawal is not suspected, you're going to correct and identify any underlying medical condition and then actually start with the oral second generation antipsychotics. So these are the new antipsychotics, which are now old, um, and they do come in generics. So it's Risperdal and Zyprexa, um, which is olanzapine. And those come as an oral, uh, and you want to offer them oral first because who likes getting a shot against their will? Nobody. So if you say, hey, I got a pill, would you take a pill for me to help you? And don't, don't say because you're acting the fool. Like say, because it's clear you're agitated and upset and I want you to get in control of yourself. Would a pill help? I have a pill for you. You can also do oral Haldol. It's $4 at Walmart, so it is available. It is around. Um, and it's not used at all because we all go right to the shop, but it is available. Then you're going to go to the injectable second generation, and then actually the fourth last line agent is injectable Haldol. But the vast majority of our protocols have Haldol as a first line medication. But side effect wise, um, it is not recommended. It's very well studied. It is safe in the elderly. It's safe in kids. It's safe in pregnancy. But it has a lot of side effects. QT prolongation, the EPS symptoms, dystonic reactions, and all those sort of things. If you think it's alcohol or a benzo, you're going to start with a benzo. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, they're just a drug addict or they're just an alcoholic. This is kind of what they have to deal with is being agitated. Remember that may be the beginnings of delirium. So as much as you may not want to help them out of their withdrawal, you also want to save their life. So you want to start with the benzos for them. Oral again if you can, injectable if you can't, or if they prefer. So agitation due to intoxication. If it's a stimulant, you're going to do oral um, or IM benzos. And then if it's a depressant, you're going to avoid the benzos because of the respiratory depression and do the antipsychotics. Now you'll notice though that Haldol is the lead medication here. And that's because again, the longevity of the studies. Haldol plus alcohol is something we know, we breathe it, we know it, we love it. So we're okay to use it there. And then if you know it's a psychiatric condition, start with their medications if you can. Um, I don't, what are your policies as far as if you show up on scene and like the wife or sister says, can they take one of their own pills? Do you allow them to take one of their pills? Oh, sounds like a conversation <laughs> starter. I would teach them that they're not usually taking anything in the MP setting. Okay. All right. So you don't just go like, sure, you're not supposed to take that pill and turn your back and just give them the glass of water and let them actually take it. No. Not either. If you're talking diabetic, I might be a little different, but talking here, probably not. All right, good to know. Heart problems, nature, glycerin. You'll let them do it. Okay. Not this. 
Um, so I would definitely have them bring their pills with them um, because again, we can use our pill ID, make sure it really is that. It's not street, some synthetic or something like that. Um, oral antipsychotics are first line if it's a psychiatric condition and then Haldol um, with a benzo and you go down that route. And then if you don't know, you do the same as you would assume it's a withdrawal. So you wanna be careful with the benzos, assuming that they're gonna crash and stop breathing and hit them with the Haldol or the antipsychotic. The bottom line though is let the patient pick. If you are allowing them an option, it really partners. If you can only give them a shot, ask them how they want it. Your arm, your leg, or your butt. Do you want it in an IV? You can do these IO if you need to. So just ask them. Say, you know, these are your options. Do you want me to drill a hole in the bone in your leg or would you like a shot? I will take a shot. Seems like a much better option now. <laughs> So the treat that causes the agitation, if it's medical, fix it first. PO should be offered over IM if you can. Antipsychotics if you can. The second generation antipsychotics, so Zyprexa, Risperdal, or Geodon are preferred unless it's alcohol. And then if using Haldol, give with a benzo. And if you're really using it, consider also with um, Benadryl. Ketamine. Ketamine, ketamine, special K. This is the new drug for everything. It will fix all of your, <laughs> everything that you have. <laughs> so low dose, sub-dissociative dose for pain control. Um, kids as well as adults, but also depression. So there are some really good studies coming out about it doing a great job for depression management. It's a low dose infusion over 40 to 60 minutes. The problem is, it is generic. So there are already clinics popping up where you can go in and get an infusion of ketamine to help your depression. Which you don't have to be a surgery center, you don't have to have a crash cart, you don't have to have anything on site because you're doing it off label and there's all these little loopholes and all this sort of thing. So do not be surprised if you start getting some phone calls for people that are not breathing because they're getting ketamine doses. Um, now, it, it is being currently FDA, they're trying to get it, another FDA indication. There's a lot of trials going on right now for it. Um, it does seem to have really good potential. It is not a cure-all no matter what you read online. High dose for anesthesia or agitation. There's some really good protocols out there that said forget the MIGs per kg dosing and just give them a straight dose. Yeah? You mentioned off-label usage. I don't know what it's on and off-label uses are. So on is um, basically anesthesia. Um, so conscious sedation or full sedation. Um, and that's pretty much it at this point. Um, and, and pain. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. Um, but of course, have at it. <laughs> you, know, you can probably find a reason for it. So Pennsylvania uh, currently allows ketamine for excited delirium, but not agitation. Virginia allows ketamine, but only after a dose of Versed. That's their EMS protocols. And I put links to their protocols at the bottom too. Um, so because your surrounding states are doing it, everybody's kind of picking up on this for the bandwagon, um, but you can always consult for it. You can always ask. Uh, we have had a couple of the medics ask, but usually they're like, I'm two minutes out. Well, can you hold it together for two minutes and then we'll see them. In RER, we are not big on ketamine yet. Um, I'll be honest, we have not, we have not bought into it, we not drank the Kool-Aid. Um, we are pushing for it though more and more. The problem at our center is anesthesia owns the ketamine. And so they're basically saying, no, it's ours, you can't have it. Um, and so we're in, in conversation right now about that. Agitated kids. So 5% of all pediatric ED visits are related to a mental health diagnosis. Um, it is recommended that you start with whatever their home meds are. Uh, more often a paradoxical reaction to meds. I would also say that that's true for people that are developmentally delayed or, or autism, autism spectrum, Asperger's, that sort of thing, tend to have a paradoxical reaction. So if you give them one dose and it doesn't work, I would switch meds. I wouldn't try and stack the doses because um, you're going to run into some respiratory issues. Benadryl, 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 um, except for that ADHD kid because that's the one that tends to have the most paradoxical reaction to it. Consider an antipsychotic. Um, there is a recent study that said a second generation, Zyprexa is okay. You do have to watch with benzos because they have higher rates of respiratory depression. I always start though actually with clonidine. Um, so clonidine alpha blocker for your kids, it's um, hypertensive but FDA approved for ADHD. Um, I like it because they don't get a high. Um, particularly your teenagers, I also use this in anybody that's withdrawing and they want to come in for just a dose for the weekend, I give them all clonidine. Um, six tabs, even if you take them all at once, doesn't matter. Um, you're going to be pretty much okay with that um, but it is a good medication all right so excited delirium do you want to do a break now and have pee time and all that stuff and then we'll get some yeah, probably, probably. I'm seeing some full bladders some glassy eyes so get up and walk around
Good? Okay. All right, so now the excitement continues. <laughs> on pins and needles. <laughs> Excited delirium syndrome. So this is the, everything we just taught you goes out the window. Um, you know, and I do not expect you to necessarily make this diagnosis in the two seconds that you're on scene, um, but it's something you need to be keeping in the back of your mind um, because the patient's life could be at risk. So when we talk about delirium versus dementia versus depression, um, there is some overlap. The biggest thing is that collateral information. Have they always been bonkers or are they bonkers in the last five minutes, the last five hours? They do a line of white stuff and now they're bonkers. Like what is the context of what's happening as best as you can get? And sometimes of course you've got to scoop and run. I get that. But any information you can get not only helps you but helps us down the road. So their attention is impaired. You may think they're psychotic because they're responding to other things. Their senses will be hyper acute, which sometimes means their sense of touch as well. So blankets are really itchy. They're bucking off restraints, that sort of thing as well. But it is reversible and treatable to the most part. Psychosis with physical distress. So autonomic hyper, um, hyper awareness. So they're gonna have fever, tachycardia, increased respiratory rate. And as we were just chatting, how do you know that? It's 100 degrees outside and they're sweating, you know, or you're going to get close enough to touch them. You're going to, they're going to let you put a thermometer in their mouth. You're definitely not doing a rectal temperature. Like, how are you going to be able to tell that they have a fever or something else? You do the best you can. I mean, if they've been fighting with the cops, they're going to be sweaty, but are they dripping sweat? Are they that agitated? Are they have hyper reflexic? Is there other things that can clue you in? It can happen because they're intoxicated or they're withdrawing. It can happen because they're starting meds or they're stopping meds. It can happen because of trauma. Taser is a big thing to keep in mind, particularly multiple tasers. So here's the problem. They're on PCP, that can do it. And then they've been tased multiple times, that can probably do it. So it's most likely a stacking issue. They have multiple things going on and you need to keep this in mind may look like hypoglycemia, hypoxic, seizures, head injury, because it depends on how long they've been down for by the time you get there. So if they've been fighting with the police and now they've collapsed, was this a collapse because of exhaustion, because they seized, or because they're dying? And you need to keep that aware of and scoop and run. It's not just that they got knocked unconscious, did they collapse and now they're unconscious. Try to get that information. Treatment is a huge bolus of IV fluids, 20 megs per kg, LR is the standing order for the state. Check that sugar, ice packs to lower temperature because you guys always have these things readily available. Um, you know, and you gotta, you gotta do what you can. If you don't have ice packs, put a cold soda. If you don't have anything cold, don't worry about it. Just don't wrap them in blankets. Try and get as much of their clothing off as you can. No Haldol, no Haldol, no Haldol, but also no Benadryl because it's an anticholinergic reaction. So it's only Versed. So this is that tricky part of that we just went through that whole algorithm that gives you all these options and now I'm saying, mm, don't do any of that, just do Versed. So do you just start with Versed each time and just cut your losses? You could, you're gonna put a lot of people to sleep that way, which may not be a bad thing. <laughs> but when your intubation rate goes through the roof, we're gonna ask questions. Um, but you may keep this in the back of your mind. Ketamine is another option for this as well. Again, the glorious ketamine, you're gonna see this all over the place. So it's just one of those things you have to keep in mind as best you can. If they were sick recently, they've been discharged recently, they're changed in medications, change in mental status, not just, oh, he's acting the way he usually does when he's off his meds, consider this as a diagnosis. Haldol, or just you don't recognize it, they're going to die. And that's very serious, obviously. So addiction. Addiction, of course, is all over the news. Numbers in the past month of the illicit drug users among people age 12 or older. Pot, 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 and more pot. And this is before it was even legal. This is nationwide. And then it's prescription pain medications. And then cocaine. Everything else is about the same. Using too. So you can last year substance use and then they're using then and marijuana. Then these homeless car duty military. Gaddick is trouble. Okay. A really good meal. It's a 
kill yourself, you'd get over.
like an hour a day. How much pot do you do? Well, I, I smoke pot to help my nausea. How much pot do you do? <laughs> well, I do a little bit of this, then I have an edible, and then I do a little bit of this, and a little bit. Do you realize this is the DTs of pot? That is what you're doing. And, no, 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 it's what cures my nausea and vomiting. Yes, just like drinking cures DTs. <laughs> you are using the substance. You are withdrawing from the marijuana. So capsaicin, so tiger balm, Bengay on the belly, it's something about the heat receptors on the stomach that can really help with that. Um, so uh, when I have my cyclic vomit in the ER, I order Bengay for them. And they'll either elope or they'll stay and they'll get better. You'll get electrolyte abnormalities, really severe potassium irregularities, and magnesium, so you can't have a cardiac issue. White count can be markedly elevated. So the problem with these is they come in puking their guts out, abdominal pain, and a white count of 25. They're getting a CT scan every single time. Or they're getting a huge GI workup. So anybody that comes in and says, oh, I get these episodes and nobody knows what it is, I, and I say, I ask this question of all patients that come in with nausea and vomiting, how much pot do you do? I just say that. How much pot do you do? And they'll either be like, oh, I don't do any pot. They'll be like, oh, you know, no, no, no. times two plus three. So we always know they're smoking at least two times that, a little bit extra. So treatment, there are no treatments for it, but they don't respond to Zofran and Reglan. These are the people that they're vomiting so much they get panic attacks. You give them Ativan and their vomiting stops. It's the Ativan that's doing it. Haldol also works for it. So, you know, you have your kids coming in with vomiting and I'm ordering them Haldol and the nurses are like, I know you don't like him, but really? I'm like, just one, just a little bit, and it takes the, and they stop puking. Um, and then you can send them home on those PO medications too. Gabapentin, which people are abusing now because it's being used so often, but it does work. N acetylcysteine, eucomist. Your Tylenol overdose medication also works for the CHS. Propanolol, Buspar, and then of course prescription uh, marijuana will work as well. All right, so naloxone update. The HOPE Act of 2017, the Maryland HOPE Act, tried to increase funding for behavioral health services, requires crisis treatment centers, so they're trying to create some psychiatric emergency departments, expands a crisis hotline, which is not out yet, um, repealed the component that people had to be trained to get naloxone. So when we first started offering naloxone, you had to go to an opioid training program, you got a little card, then you could go to the pharmacy and get Narcan. Nope, we can all walk over to CVS right now and say we want Narcan and get it. That, that's because of the HOPE Act. So there's a statewide prescription standing order that basically says anybody that walks in can get Narcan. However, that is only for adults. Price is dictated, you run it through your commercial insurance or, and this is where it's tricky, it can be capped cash price for people that are cash paying, but if they go to those opioid trainings, they can get it for free. So people that don't have insurance, I still will tell them to go to get to the local health department to get the card and then get the kit for free. Yeah. But everybody else. Is so the Narcan, the sin, is the nasal mist. So they originally had it with the atomizer and nobody can figure out how to do that. And then it was on back order. So now it is the Narcan spray. $75 cash, depending on the pharmacy, but it can go up to 150 or 300 which you're talking about people that they don't have that money. And even if they, like, you know, are they going to spend it on that versus drugs? Probably not. Um, so getting them to go to the program and do it. This is a big thing for the families. Um, so making sure the families are aware when you have an overdose patient, if families are coming, or if you're picking them up from the home, telling them to get a Narcan kit in the home is really important. But I went and got the, I did the session and got yeah. the free Narcan, but when it expired, I brought the card in, yeah. $125. So the expiration date is probably not valid. Nobody can officially tell you that, but our pharmacist has even said that it's probably good for at least a year afterwards. But it's gonna be the same as with anything. It's, efficacy is gonna go down a little bit, but it's gonna be better than nothing. Um, so I would, you know, have like six expired kits in your house is fine. Um, oh, God. But yeah, sorry. Oh! <laughs> yeah. One of the other things that, um, I don't work down at the, at the health department, and one of the other things that's happening with some of the um, Narcan is that yeah, while your regular street user may not choose to spend money on the Narcan and get mm -hmm. this for the families, it's also the senior adults, the whole back has increased because of the, those who are, or not just seniors, but folks who get injured a lot, um, who might be prescribed uh, opioids. Yep. The polypharmacology mm -hmm. of folks going, and I'm not just talking about opioids and Everything. Stuff, but yeah. the other meds that they're using that 
potentiate the opioids. I'm all for the fact yep. that anybody who's getting a, an opioid prescription can also get so pain management is strongly encouraged that all of their patients should do it and I will be honest one of the large pain management offices in our area declines to do that and their thing is just like the safe sex thing of we don't want to give them Narcan because it'll teach them to misuse their medications because they'll get away with misusing it I prescribe Narcan all the time if I'm prescribing a benzo even if I'm not giving them a Narcan or an opioid I give them Narcan as well anything that has Tylenol codeine they get a Narcan prescription um, and people get offended you know what are you calling me an addict I said no but if your kid gets into it your dog gets into it you know I mean the canine units are carrying Narcan for their dogs now so you know you have to just and I when I tell them that they're like oh I, I can see your point you know I'm not doing this because I think you're gonna have a mistake but I want you to be alive if you do have a mistake even it's huge. Those, from not misusing. Yep. Just yep. Checking what else yeah. Not realize. Right. You know, they take cold medicine on top of their usual Xanax and, and oxycodone, and they're not misusing any of the prescriptions. But it's just now they have a cold. They're not breathing normally. I forgot my CPAP machine. Whatever. It's those little things that trip them over the edge. Um, so the other thing is plan for increasing substance use treatment in jail. So to try and link them to treatment, not just using that as a drunk take to sober up. And now it requires all hospitals to have a discharge protocol for patients with a substance use disorder or an overdose. So an umbrella phrase that means we have to now start screening everybody. So using that SBIRT, screening everybody for substance use disorder and then having a protocol in place. So what does that look like? So the standing order for the state of the pharmacy. Um, and then you, and now we actually give out Narcan for people that come in. So Carol, um, Upper Chesapeake, and Anne Arundel all are dispensing Narcan kits. We have a little kit, has a two dose um, of the nasal Narcan auto injector, or excuse me, the nasal Narcan spray. And then it has all the resource cards, the Good Samaritan law update, but it also has the social stuff. Here's how to get legal aid. Here's housing phone number. Here's the food pantry. Because we know the addiction is not in isolation. It's a social issue. Um, so it has all of that in it. The voice directed auto injector is available. Money, 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 money. Um, but it is really good. So it has a countdown. It's just, they also have an EpiPen version, um, so an epinephrine auto injector. It's voice activated. So you click the bank and it says place on thigh, press, hold, one, two, three, four. Now, and, and so it's very nice. So it's really good for people that are developmentally delayed or visually impaired or kids. Now, with all of this standing order, it is 18 and over, but they are trying to lower that age. So Carroll County is writing their own policy that teenagers can go into the training and get Narcan kits because they realize they're overdosing, but they're also watching their parents overdose. And so having the kits at home. The, the, FCO, the auto injector, mm -hmm. the old ones are only half dose. They actually took them all back and made them, instead of one milligram dose, yeah. they had to take them all back and make them two, two milligram dose. Gotcha. So there's some people that have the old one still. They have one, one, so it's two, it's not enough. Gotcha. I was going to say, especially with what's on And I think that's a big thing, too, is that probably was an okay dose, but not anymore. Not with the mixes of things we're seeing. Yeah. Um, so the nice Narcan wake up. I am begging you from the bottom of my heart, please do not push that extra dose of Narcan at the door just to teach them a lesson. <laughs> it doesn't work for anybody. They come up swinging. They come up puking. And you can't reach them when they're that upset. There's a good description of a guy who was on narcotics for cancer pain and he got reversed with naloxone and he said it was waking up with razor blades in my body. I would do anything to stop that pain. You are full reversing them with that. Don't punish them. They're punished enough. You want them to be alive and you want to get them into treatment. They're not going to go to treatment if you hit them with that extra dose just to teach them a lesson and make them feel God awful. So do a nice Narcan wake up. Titrate to breathing, not to combativeness, okay? You can use it in a nebulizer. If they're breathing more than six times a minute, they'll breathe it in, nice and gradually wake up. You can do a very slow titration through the IV, through an IV push, but you dilute it. Do an IO. Same thing with kids, particularly these big kids. You can't, if they've accidentally taken their parents' medication or overdosed themselves, and you give them the full adult dose, good luck, all right? Have that held already, because you're gonna have to put them back down. If you're giving Narcan intranasally, mm -hmm. um, it, it, first of all, it's hard to control the amount, but 
it, do you have to give more to get the same effect as you would IV? You mean as far as squeezing the whole thing in? Yeah. So the problem is, is you never know how much, and then you always have to worry, are they congested? Do they have a nosebleed or a blockage? So I would say if you're going to do the nasal, you're going to have to push all of it at once. But don't hit them with a second dose if they're still breathing. You know, let them start to go back out and then hit it with that. Yeah, but you can't really do like a half pump. It just doesn't work very well. So personality disorders. This is one of those things because it helps inform you of, of how, like, why is it everything I say this person is just not taking well? Why is this conversation going nowhere? I'm standing in front of you pretending to be an expert. No, I'm telling you right now, I get in fights with patients on a regular basis. People walk out, people cuss me out, people throw things. Just because you know how to deal with it doesn't make it easy to do. It's a work in progress. You will have those ones you're like, I just, that didn't go well at all. Learn from it and then learn how to do better. So paranoid personality disorders. Distrust of others interprets everything as malevolent. Everything is an attack. So the problem is they set, set up situations where they elicit a hostile response. So they go up to a person of color, they start cussing at them, call them the N-word, the guy takes a swing at them. See, all people of color are aggressive. Are you kidding me? You totally picked a fight with him. No, I was just expressing my opinion and he went off reinforcing that bigoted outlook okay same thing with a spouse all women are cheaters and you say you're a cheater you're a cheater and she cheats on you no it's not that you pushed her away but it's reinforcing your idea that all women are cheaters so wolverine bruce wayne right they're very paranoid and they set up those situations Schizoid, so pattern of detachment, restricted range of emotions. They don't get emotional connection. It doesn't make sense to them. And so they get, they're awkward in social situations and people sense their awkwardness so they aren't really genuine. So they continues to reinforce those awkward interactions. So they come up to you, they're a little weird. They're like, ugh, dude, you're weird. People don't get me so I'm not gonna interact with people. They are not all serial killers, contrary to popular belief. But if you watch Dexter, you see how he just stares at people sometimes and they're like, what's wrong? with you and he's like trying to figure out why they're acting the way that they do you will see this sometimes for autism spectrum and you have to tease out if it's autism or if it's a personality disorder theoretically you can't have both but of course in psychiatry we like to label people with all kinds of letters so you can have whatever letters you want schizotypal personality disorders so social interaction and weird behavior so doc brown from back to the future willy wonka magical thinking so this magical thinking is, I can control weather patterns. If I wear the color blue, then it's going to rain. Um, if I do this, then this happens. They might have odd speech phrases. So somebody that you're saying, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. And they're like, oh, you know, the blah, blah, blah. And you're like, that doesn't make sense to me. Can you explain to me what it means when you're doing that? Well, I could explain to you, but you're just of the lower caste and you're not going to understand. You're right, I probably won't. So is there anything I could understand? Help me to learn about your world. Help me to understand what's going on for you they're not psychotic they're weird they're a little off they're a little different high rates of depression and again must be differentiated from autism antisocial so high rates obviously in the justice system high rates of interactions with police lack of remorse and they may blame the victim for falling for it so in kids this is conduct disorder but in adults it's antisocial personality disorder previously referred to as psychopaths or sociopaths you have to tease out the bipolar and the schizophrenia so example of this from a great book I, I read called the boy who was raised as a dog and so he's a psychiatrist and he specializes in trauma and they said you know this guy was convicted of killing his girlfriend his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend were trying to get him off the death penalty would you see if he's medically competent so he sits down with them he says you know i'm hired by your lawyer basically setting him up to say like what can you tell me he says so why did if you could change anything about that day what would you change and the kid said i wouldn't have worn the boots oh. and he said well I'm sorry, what? He's like, I wouldn't have worn the boots. They caught me because of the boots I was wearing. And he said, so you don't regret doing it? Oh, she had it coming to her. She shouldn't have cheated on me and been with that guy, so she deserved to get killed. But if I wouldn't have worn the boots, I wouldn't have gotten caught. 
So this is your con man, very hard to rehabilitate, which is why we want to try and diagnose them early. Get them those interventions, help them make emotional connections, because there's no way you're going to connect with that guy now. He's trying to one-up you before you one-up him. So in their mind, the world is out to get them, so I'm going to get you first. And if you fell for it, that's because you're an idiot and you fell for it. It's your fault. I'm just trying to do me just like you're trying to do you. Borderline. Borderline is a pattern of instability and impulsiveness, frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, unstable relationships, suicidal behavior. You know these people. They're usually women. That is a little bit classist, but we picked on the boys enough tonight, so we're going to pick on the girls a little bit. So it's the person that cuts and then calls takes the bottle of pill, posts it on Facebook. It's still a cry for help. They don't want to feel as bad as they do, but they don't go around it a really good way because they push everybody away and then they complain about how alone they are. Very reactive in mood, so you can't often tease it out from bipolar disorder. So people are like, Tinkerbell, like what? Think about Tinkerbell's relationship with Peter Pan, right? <laughs> She's totally psycho, <laughs> exactly. Like he went to leave and she rained shit down. Like she did not put up with that. And then that's Harley Quinn from um, the new Suicide Squad that came out. Which Winnie the Pooh character is most likely histrionic? Winnie the Pooh, Al, Eeyore, or Tigger? One of your votes. Histrionic. Eeyore. Anybody vote for anybody else? So histrionic are excessively emotional and attention seeking. So Tigger, right? All over the place, but also that the theatrically of emotions, they're easily influenced. So you say, oh, you know, I did that once and, and that's how this happened. Oh my God, that happened to me too. You know, they're way over the top. They consider relationships to be closer than they are. So this is the person says, you know, I know the president. You're like, okay, follow him on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of people do. No, he and I, we're tight. He reads my tweets. Don't think he does. No, he does. He retweeted me once. How did he retweet you? Well, I retweeted a CNN article that he retweeted. Well, he didn't retweet. No, you're not close. You don't have a relationship. They also have high rates of somatization. So, oh my God, do you remember that time I had cancer? You had the stomach bug. No, it was almost cancer, but it, they cured me. It's okay. Zofran does not cure cancer. It did for me. I'm one of those case reports. Okay, sure. Way over the top. Narcissistic. We've all had that boss, right? <laughs> this is the person we've worked for. Pattern of grandiosity, need for admiration, lack of empathy. I am the most awesome thing on the planet. Don't you even try to do anything else. Increased sense of self-importance, exaggerates achievements. You know, my infection rate is less than 1%. It's the best in the hospital. Actually, it's five. No, it's not. They fudge the data. It's one. No, they're exploitive, they're arrogant. They're envious of others, though, and or believe people are envious of them. So this is the person that always buys the newer car because, you know, Jim down the street got this car. I'm going to get the newest car version of that, and I'm going to buy bigger and bigger and bigger. They have the trophy wives. They kind of, you know, everybody's looking at them. But in reality, nobody cares, and nobody likes them, and they feel very empty as a result. I think you should swap out Dr. Strange and put in Iron Man instead. He's more <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in the second round two, version two, we'll update that. Which of the following personality disorder is least likely to be your patient? Borderline, avoidant, antisocial, or schizoid? <laughs> right. Well, but then when the police take them down, then they're your patient when they're unconscious person that there's a multi-car accident you roll up and you say sir sir are you okay and he's like I'm good well, but sir your, your legs hanging off it's it's not important there's somebody else that's more important than me sir you're kind of bleeding out I'm, I'm okay I don't want to bother you you guys are really busy and I really appreciate everything you've done please I'm sure there's other people they are so um, concerned by how they appear to other they're so worried they want a close um, relationship but they're so worried that it's not going to work out that they don't even try so they're exceptionally lonely they view themselves as socially inept and unappealing inferiority complex is linked to that so Charlie Brown like nobody loves me you know I'm just kind of a bum what's that <laughs> yes. but he did have friends so you can make friends 
So dependent personality disorder, a need to be taken care of that leans on submissive. So the minions, C3PO, they don't want positions of responsibility. So this is somebody that actually turns down a promotion. They feel helpless as, when they're alone, so they seek a relationship as a source of support. They most often date a borderline who they usually meet inpatient, of course. So the borderline says, you know, I hate you. Get out of my house. The defendant says, okay. And then they start to leave. The borderline says, no, 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 come back. Okay. And they're trapped in this cycle. And both of them want more, but they can't express it and they can't get to it. Often linked to a chronic physical illness or separation as a child. So again, that isolation and they don't want to be left alone. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So this is kind of the hero complex, a perfectionist, they want control. This is your office manager sometimes. It's like the budget is due on the first, not on the second, not a minute later. Everything has to be just this way because if you deviate from that, crap hits the fan. And then when something changes, you're like, well, we're gonna try something different. If it doesn't go perfect, I told you that wasn't gonna work. You should have just done it my way. I've always done it this way. But Sir, you're using a pen and paper and we have this thing called Excel. Nope, computers are not neat. I know how to do it, I'm gonna stick it with that. They can struggle though when the rules don't indicate a correct answer. So I think that's a perfect example with Captain America and Superman of, I don't know, like, this, do I be the bad guy? There's kind of this wishy-washy, like do I do this, do I pick that? Linked to anxiety disorders, phobias, eating problems. Somatization, factitious, and conversion disorder. So somatization is a continued focus on the symptoms. You know these people. My stomach's making that noise again. I need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Sir, I've told you, when you eat a lot of beans, you're gonna be gassy. <laughs> Pretty sure you're okay. This one's the one, I just know it. You know women present with atypical heart symptoms. It's a heart attack for sure. It's the fourth time today, ma'am. Pretty sure you're okay. But we've gotta take you to the hospital to check you out. So they often think normal things are harbingers of badness. The trick is to minimize the workup. So this is a single trope, single EKG. You wait in the lobby. When it's negative, we discharge you from the lobby. You don't reinforce the patient role. You try to keep the workup to the minimum. The problem is bad things still happen. And because they usually have seen so many specialists, they have so many things done, they either have a medication side effect, they have a reaction to surgery, they have a problem with that. It helps to have set appointments or check-ins, and there are places that are starting to have medical staff in fire halls to do these kind of rounding on these home patients to try and preemptively stop them from calling. So every Tuesday at two, we're gonna stop by, check your oxygen, check your sugar, see how you're doing, and you know that every Tuesday at two, so you make that list of all the symptoms you've had, and then when we're by, you're gonna run it by us. But then the problem is you tell them, but you should still call for chest pain. Well, they're gonna have chest pain. So you try not to give them things. You don't do that review of systems checklist. You just say, what else is going on? What does that mean for you? What are you worried might happen? What's the best thing we can do to comfort you in this moment? And always ask what's triggering for them. Illness anxiety disorder, which is the new name for being a hypochondriac, is more focused on a specific diagnosis. I'm sure I have melanoma. This freckle was not there yesterday. Versus I have a rash or I feel achy or I feel generalized. Factitious disorder are the fakers, okay? This is the only one where you're allowed to say you're faking it and knock it off and suck it up. <laughs> they present themselves as being ill, impaired, or injured. In, for factitious disorder, there's no obvious reward other than being the patient. They like the role of being sick and being cared for. It's Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when they're making a family member sick in order to get the attention. So this is the person that, you, that has been found to like be injecting stool into their IV or doing other things with um, putting, pricking their finger to put blood in their urine, different things like that. Malingering is they're doing it for secondary gain. So workers comp, my husband won't leave me if I stay sick, different things like that versus a generalized, I like being the patient. And that's compared to conversion disorder. This is a little bit more slippery. So conversion disorder is not faking it not faking it. So the way I describe it is a physical display of psychological distress. A physical symptom of psychological distress. I am so stressed out, I just found out my mom is terminally ill and now I can't see. They literally can't see, they are not faking it. So they get a full workup, they see neuro, they see opto, they go down to Hopkins, all this thing, but until you deal with the stress of dealing with their mother's diagnosis, their vision will not return. Now, pseudo seizures are really tricky. 
Pseudo seizures are no longer called pseudo seizures because we have fancier names, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, PNES. <laughs> With those, you can have the gamut of the malingerer, fractitious, I'm seizing, watch me seize. Oh, you're not watching, I'm seizing again, okay? All the way to actual seizures where they are frothing at the mouth, they are incontinent, they're biting their tongue, they have a post-ictal state, but on EEG, they are not actively seizing. It's usually somewhere in the middle. And again, until you treat the underlying distress, they will continue to have symptoms. So one of my favorite ones was this girl that came in and I'm talking to her and she's doing this like tilt, jerk thing, eye blinking, and I'm thinking, crap, dystonic, I put her on benztropine, give her Benadryl, all this stuff, not getting any better. And I mean, she's like drooling on herself because she's so sedated now and she's still twitching. So I start talking to her a little bit. You know, sometimes when people are sick, it's because there's other things going on. I'm not saying this is in your head, I'm not saying that you're making it up, but a lot of times, you know, when you're sick, there's a lot of stress happening in your life. Is there anything you could think of that's stressful for you right now? She's like, oh, well, you know, my boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, you know, I'm wondering how you're dealing with that. She's like, oh, not too well, I'm not sleeping. As we're talking, her twitching's getting less. It did not go completely away, but it was more manageable. And I said, wow, you know, we've been sitting here talking and I just, I can't help but notice that your twitching's getting a little bit better. It starts up a little bit more, yeah. okay? And so now it's a question of, is it starting up more because we're talking about it and she's aware of it, or is it because she's more aware of the stress? I said, well, you know, again, it's the physical manifestation of the amount of stress that you're under. You're not faking this, but you're not well. How can we help you to be well? What can we do? How can we connect you with services? I'm going to put a referral for the social worker. The hospital is going to call you in a couple of days. Make sure you got in with a therapist. I'm going to give you a copy of all your blood tests that show that everything's all right. Do you want me to talk to your boyfriend about this? What can we do to help that? Why did I do that extra effort? Because I didn't want her coming back in 12 hours with the same symptoms. It wouldn't have fixed anything. And unfortunately, she probably would have gotten another provider, would have gotten the whole workup, maybe gotten admitted for something that didn't need. And what does that do? Reinforce that I'm sick, reinforce that I'm not well, reinforce that I'm broken. And I was trying to build her strength up in that moment. So medically unexplained symptoms, MUS, kind of covers all of that. It also covers irritable bowel. Some people consider fibromyalgia under that category. Um, but it's not a true diagnosis, it's just one of those catch-alls. And then your vocab term for the day is alexithymia. So it's a personality trait where a person has difficulty identifying feelings and differentiating that from body, from body sensations. So basically, well, do you think you're anxious? I don't know, what does that feel like? Well, your stomach can turn, you can feel kind of creepy under your skin. Yeah, I guess that's that. That's, this is what anxious feels like. They don't have that connection, sometimes seen with personality disorders. All right, so I need four volunteers. <laughs> Come on. Huh? Low man on the totem pole, Randy, for the win. All right, so we need the patient and we need the provider. And then I need two other victims. Oh, uh, we got a patient. I was gonna say we got a Gonna be the Alright. I'm on good cop or bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's gonna be the provider? Who's on scene? Alright, so you're gonna whisper in her ear and you're gonna just narrate what's going on in the room. Whatever you see behind her, just constantly just chatter, chatter, chatter. Okay? You're gonna be looking around the room and just saying, Oh, I see Jim, I see this person. Like, just narrate what you're seeing around the room and just constantly talk in her ear. Okay. Okay? Alright. So you're going to make a comment on things like, oh, what is he thinking? Why does he think this? What's he doing? And just constantly talk in her other ear. So you're whispering in her ear, just constantly whispering, like, why did he ask you that question? What is he thinking? What does he know? Okay. All right. So here's the deal. You roll on scene. You got a call saying that she has chest pain. So you're going to ask the normal kind of questions that you would ask for that. You know, what's going on? Why are you here? Do you have any allergies? What does it hurt? All that kind of stuff. But what you don't know is this person's hallucinating, okay? <laughs> All right, so go ahead. So, hi, ma'am. My name's Scott. So what's going on today? Go ahead and answer, Randy, as best you can. I'm not feeling well. Yeah, so what's, what do you mean not feeling well? Can you describe that for me? Is it in your stomach? Is it in Just your... in my chest, I'm having a funny feeling. Okay. Uh, can you describe that feeling for me? <laughs> it's it's pressure. It's it's a lot of pressure. Okay, what's your name, ma'am? <laughs> Randy. 
Randy. <laughs> What's your uh, date of birth, Randy? November. November what? <laughs> All right, that's good. We don't want we don't get our social security covered or anything like that. <laughs> so how was that for you? It's like you can't even hear yourself. Think right. after a while. So you see where the repetition, like you would need him to repeat the question over and over and I over. I hear you. Right. We just you went crazy. So, <laughs> so when you're watching her face, what were the clues that she wasn't kind of seeing or listening to you? What were you noticing? Yeah, like the I facial expressions, the eyes wandering, the eye, the inability to make eye contact, mm -hmm. the eyes going up in her head when she was searching for the answer. <laughs> yeah, right? So those are those little things that something's just not making sense here, that's you know? Right. And that's, and, and sometimes saying like, I'm, I'm seeing that it's a hard time for you to answer some of these questions. Is there something I can do? Or is there other things going on that's kind of distracting? It may be she's like, I just got this text from my daughter and something is wrong and I need to go. It might be something like that. Or it may genuinely be she's just like, I, I'm sorry, I'm just really having a hard time hearing you. Why, why can't you hear me? What's happening right now? And there's sirens, there's police, there's other things. Or maybe it's something internal. Great, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. All right. So after we put, <laughs> I owe her twenty bucks for that. All right. So motivational interviewing. This is the other MI, not the cardiac arrest, but motivational interviewing. So I want you to have a seat next to somebody else because you're gonna you're gonna do this with a partner. So if you're not, if you're by yourself, make a friend. interviewing this is one of those things of it's a very easy skill to gain and it gets you a lot of rewards it works on spouses it works on children it works on doctors in the ER in addition to your patients so learn this stuff it's really useful in a lot of ways so how it normally goes how a conversation goes one of you is the patient the other person's the expert so pick something as a patient you want to do better what would your new year's resolution be other than giving up sobriety that is not an option okay what is something that you want to change i want to sleep more i want to floss more i want to exercise i want to eat my fruits and vegetables and the expert you convince them why they need to change so just spend a minute being a patient and having an expert telling them why they need to change this is the conversation we have every day. You know, man, your diabetes is high. You need to get on that. What's going to happen? Tell them all the bad things. So just spend a couple minutes with your partner. Tell them what you're trying to work on. It's not a secret. And convince them why they need to change. You're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. There we go. <laughs>
needing to change? Oh, we're going to do another one, so stay. So what did you feel as they were lecturing you? The patients out there. Even more failed or trying to be convinced. You weren't being like you were trying to be convinced to change. Annoyed, right? It's the same as like that calm down. No, you calm down. You change. Why should I change? I know it's bad. Get off my case. Think about all the, 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 the COPDers that are on oxygen that are still smoking, right? How many times have you rolled up and been like, seriously, you know, Sharon, get off the cigarettes. I'm not, just let me finish this one. I'll turn the oxygen back on. You know, like, no, come on. You know, that's not doing anything for you. Oh, I know. Get off my case. Blah, blah, blah. Don't you have other things to do? How about as the expert? How did you feel? Talking to a brick wall. Talking to a brick wall, right? You're just watching them and they're just arguing. You're getting nowhere. You're both getting frustrated. Nothing's getting done. Two cards. Now we're going to buy three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good goal. Okay. So, motivational interview. Now, the expert, instead of that top down, instead of that authority figure, you're going to partner with them. And so, these are some statements that you can say to them. If things continue like they are, what do you think is likely to happen in the future? What's the worst can, can happen? What do you like about whatever it is that's the status quo? So spend a couple minutes, read these over, and just try talking to the person. And you can read off the slide. Ask these questions of your partner. Okay. Yeah. So talk to your partner and just try and see that same task, that same thing they were trying to change. Does it go any easier with this? Frustration. More solution focused instead of uh, more on what could you do differently instead of what you're doing wrong. Exactly. So when I have a patient that smokes a pack a day, is on oxygen, COPD, and I walk in and they have the cigarette pack, you know, sitting in their pocket, and I say, tell me when you're ready to quit, just let me know. And I just leave it there. You're not going to lecture me? No. I know you know you need to quit. I'm not here to lecture you. You tell me when you're ready. If you need help, I'm here to help. And just leave it at that. And it takes the wind out of their sails. Then they start arguing with you. Well, well but you know it's, it's making my COPD worse. I do. You do too. Well, but you're not going to get on my case? No. What can I do for you today? Well, well shit. <laughs> what, about, what about those patches? Well, have you tried them? Yeah, they don't work at all. All right. Don't use them. <laughs> well, well, what about the gum? Have you tried it? Yeah, I don't like the taste. Me neither. It's all right. <laughs> So you see, they start looking for the solutions. They start solving their own problems. Well, we heard about Chantix. Yeah, I don't know if my insurance would cover it. Well, did you know Wellbutrin, antidepressant, also used for smoking cessation? You said you were having a lot of stress in your life. Could we do two birds, one stone? Yeah, I can give that a try. All right, cool. Scale of 1 to 10, 10 being you are absolutely certain you will quit smoking tomorrow, 0 meaning no way in hell, how sure you can quit? How about a 6? Why not a 4? Oh, because, I mean, you know, it's pretty easy to cut down by half a pack. 
hopefully you guys won't be seeing them in two weeks, but when they follow up with their doctor, I'll be interested to see if you guys, if you cut down by a pack a day. And then it doesn't matter if they did it or not, because now you have a follow-up conversation. So that last time we were here, you said you were going to cut back by a half a pack. How'd that go? Oh man, it was terrible. What happened? Well, you know, my dog got sick. I'd take him to the vet. Oh, so you had a lot of stress going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and smoking works for you. Yeah, man. It really helps a lot. What do you like about smoking? I get out of the house. So it's not the smoking, it's getting out of the house. Well, you could say that on my, my wife all the time. Nag, nag, nag. So you like getting out of the house? Yeah. And whenever I smoke, I have a beer. So you like the beer? Yeah. So the real issue is not the smoking, it's the beer. So if we get you to just quit drinking beer, will you quit cigarettes? I don't know. What if we change to liquor? Could we change to liquor instead of beer? Would that curb it? Oh, we could try that. So partnering with them and figuring out what it is, you're more likely to actually solve the problem. And that takes just a couple minutes. So the frequent flyers that you have, you know, hey, your back pain's acting up again. You know what happens? We take you, they treat you like a drug addict, you elope, you leave AMA. What do you think we can do to change it this time? Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, if they just gave me one Percocet, I'd be all right. What if they don't? What else can we do? Can we get you roped in with some services? Can I have one of the people at the hospital do a social work for, referral for you? What about PT, OT, massage therapy? What can we arrange for you? So for your listening pleasure, if you have a commute, there's a whole bunch of podcasts on dealing with the upset patient. A lot of those same things, those techniques, how to calm people down. A little bit of Haldol for psychosis, psychiatric emergencies, suicide assessments. If you like reading, the 30-page ASEP guideline is available for you. And then those project beta papers are on your paperwork. And then these are the recommendations. So the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry. And again, they have um, a nice, it's old fashioned listserv, but they have a nice conversations about what people are doing. American Society for Addiction Medicine is a great conference and resource. They have a nice bridge between the medicine side of things, the addiction as a medical problem, and the social work kind of side of things. Motivational interviewing in healthcare. It is not a textbook. It's about 140 pages. It has all those kind of little vignettes, those little stories, ways to partner, how to talk people down, convince them to change. But you're not trying to convince them, you're letting them convince themselves. And that's the difference. And that verbal judo book. I am a big believer in foam, the free open access to medical education. I will share this all for free. I'm not charging you like, you know, a quarter a click or something like that. Um, so email me if you want copies, if you have questions. I will not look at your rash or your mole, but I will answer any other questions that I can. I really appreciate you guys having me and thank you to Randy for inviting me. I hope it was enjoyable for you guys. questions about anything that we covered or anything else you want to yell at Carol anything comes to mind thank you, thank you.